This is Mrs. O'Neill for Chapter 9, Section 1, Chemical Names and Formulas. Repeat after me these vocab words. Acid, base, binary compound, law of definite proportions, law of multiple proportions, monatomic ion, polyatomic ion, all right, so just like always, finish this video, write in those few notes, and then next time we meet, you will be able to look at your chapter or go through the chapter in class and write those definitions. Again, what am I preparing you for? That vocab quiz to understand that terminology. So in this chapter, first I want to read you an article about two elements, sodium and chlorine. And because of these two elements and how they bond with each other is going to tell us how important this chapter really is on understanding and being able to properly name compounds and make their chemical formulas. We find elemental chlorine only rarely and elemental sodium not at all in the common substances of our everyday world. And for a good reason, they are both extremely reactive and can be highly dangerous substances if they aren't used with care. And I want to bring back here to your attention, sodium is just Na, but chlorine is one of those diatomic molecules. It has to be written with that little two. All right, here we go. Chlorine is capable of destroying living tissue and can be a health hazard and even deadly if it is inhaled in more than trace amounts. So again, if you think about chlorine, you probably hmm, think in yourself, well, there's chlorine in bleach, there's chlorine in our pools, but remember, it's a very, very small amount, and hopefully this makes sense to you. Because it kills bacteria, chlorine is used in small quantities to eliminate infectious organisms from both swimming pools and public drinking water. So again, only in small amounts. If you use too much of it, very, very harmful. So it says, it's also very effective household bleaching agent. You can smell the odor of traces of elemental chlorine in the air around swimming pools and around open bottles of liquid household bleach. And you can taste it in the municipal drinking water of some regions. Released into the atmosphere in large volumes, it can kill plants and any animal that breathes it. So chlorine, as helpful as it is in killing bacteria to keep us healthy, it's also very dangerous in larger amounts. All right, chlorine was the first of a series of poisonous gases to be used as weapons in World War I. So again, for you history buffs, on April 22nd, 1915, in a battle near Belgium city of Ypres, German troops released large quantities of gas from cylinders stored in their trenches. Wind carried the greenish yellow gas across the battlefield to positions held by French and other allied troops. Coupled with a vigorous artillery attack, the chlorine forced the allied forces to retreat. The gas attack was so successful that chlorine and other poisonous irritating gases were used repeatedly during the rest of the war. These various applications illustrate the problem with trying to label chemicals as good or bad, or as beneficial or harmful. The same elemental chlorine that kills when used as war gas saves lives when it's used to purify drinking water. It makes our lives safer, easier, and more pleasant as it rids swimming pools of bacteria and takes stains out of clothing. Released into the atmosphere in large quantities, it has served as a war gas. Released judiciously, again very small amounts, into swimming pools and drinking water, it helps prevent epidemics. The quantities of good and bad aren't properties of the chlorine itself, only of how we ourselves use it. 
So this is a good illustration of trying to get us to understand certain chemicals, certain elements, certain compounds can be good or bad or both. Hmm. So sometimes it's about the quantity of the element or compound and sometimes it doesn't matter how much there is. It's going to be good or bad. So what compound forms when highly reactive elemental sodium comes into contact with highly reactive elemental chlorine. So can you come up with that compound that contains both sodium and chlorine? Hopefully you said NaCl or sodium chloride or ah, our ordinary table salt that we eat every day. So isn't that kind of strange that two elements that by themselves are so dangerous can combine to make something that we need in our daily diet? So what are the risks and benefits of these chemical properties? Well, sodium chloride, the compound that forms with elemental sodium, reacts with elemental chlorine, is a relatively harmless electrolyte. And electrolyte just means that it breaks up into ions that many of us use daily to modify that taste of food. While it isn't completely without hazard, it's implicated as a contributing factor in high blood pressure or hypertension, and when eaten in large quantities can be deadly, especially to small animals, children, and infants. So common table salt simply isn't the same class as elemental sodium or chlorine, yet it does compose of the same elements why both elemental sodium and chlorine should be so dangerous, and yet the sodium and chlorine ions of their compound, sodium chloride, so benign, stems partly from the difference between an atom and an ion. Oh, I said that backwards, but it doesn't matter, right? So there's going to be a real difference in atoms and ions. So this example shouldn't lead us to assume that when elements themselves are hazardous, their compounds will necessarily be harmless. So we want to remember that each individual atom and molecule that compounds they're forming are going to be, it's going to be varying, okay? It's not going to be the same all around. So let's look at these two elements. So, hmm, we have a nitrogen and oxygen. Again, notice those twos. Those twos tell us that these two elements exist as diatomic molecules. Okay. The reverse can easily be true. For example, elemental nitrogen and oxygen, the principal gases of the air we inhale many, multiple times each minute, are themselves ordinarily entirely harmless to us. Yet, several of their compounds are quite hazardous. Nitrogen dioxide, for example, a compound containing twice as many oxygen as nitrogen, is partially responsible for the damage of acid rain and can produce a potentially fatal inflammation of the lungs if inhaled. So this is the exact opposite of what we just talked about. Nitrogen and oxygen by themselves are harmless, but put them together as a compound and it's very dangerous. The only generalization we can make is that no generalization is possible. There's no necessary connection between a hazard of an element and the chemical form it's in. Neither elements, compounds, atoms, ions, nor molecules are necessarily filled with either risks or benefits to us. In any case, both risks and benefits we derive from them depend, as we have already seen, on how we use them. So. Different from the article that we just read here, name a hazardous compound from harmless or beneficial elements, and can you name a harmless, again, other than the one that we just talked about, compound from hazardous elements. So pause the video and again, see if you can come up with a compound from hazardous elements and a, uh, an o, a, a harmless compound from uh, harmless, uh, I don't know if I said that right, right? Harmless to harm and uh, harm to harmless. All right, so maybe you came up with something like, 
hmm, water is okay for us, but hydrogen peroxide is not. So now we're going to notice these two formulas, H2O versus H2O2. So just adding one more oxygen to water is going to form something very harmful, right? Water is okay, but hydrogen peroxide to drink, not okay. And how about something like carbon dioxide versus carbon monoxide? The carbon dioxide is okay. That's in the air. We breathe that every day. But if we inhale too much carbon monoxide, uh, that could be deadly. So again, why did I make you read this? Well, for those of you who might be allergic to certain antibiotics, let's look at these three as an example. There's penicillin, amoxicillin, and Bactrim. And notice all three antibiotics contain carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. But notice these little subscripts. These little subscripts tells us the formula, the chemical formula, the difference between all three of them are different amounts of those particular elements. So this is what makes science great. If you're allergic to penicillin, that's okay because there are so many other antibiotics that are out there that can do the same thing. But your body and everybody's body is different, reacts to different chemicals in different ways. So that's why this um, uh, article, I thought, and this chapter is so important because it could mean a doctor prescribing to you something going from life to death. So it really is important. All right, so now let's look at your notes. Get out that packet of notes if you didn't already do so. And we're going to do some naming of ions. So in this section, you'll be able to identify the charges of monatomic ions, mono meaning one, using that periodic table and name those ions. We're also going to talk about polyatomic ions and how we're going to write those names and formulas of the common ones. And you're going to identify two common endings for those polyatomic ions. In the play Romeo and Juliet, William Shakespeare wrote, What's in a name? That which we call a rose, by any other name, would smell so sweet. A rose is rosa in Spanish, warra in Arabic, and hulab in Hindi. Hopefully I said that right. To truly understand another culture, you must first learn the language used in that culture. Similar to understanding chemistry, you must learn its language. I've been talking about that since day one. Part of learning the language of chemistry involves understanding how to name ionic compounds. For this, you will need to know how to name the ions first. So again, pause the video, read as you write, fill in those blanks, and then play to hear my words. Guys, I'm not going to say too much about this, except for mono means one, so we're talking about a single atom with a charge. You know this information about cations, and the only thing I'm going to say is now you need to understand that those cations, you're just going to use that element's name. However, when we're talking about those anions, when we're talking about those nonmetals, we're going to have to change the ending of those nonmetals to IDE, and you're going to see how that pertains if you already didn't learn that in chapter 7, right? In chapter 7, we already know that we're going to take those non-metals and change those endings to IDE. So, ooh, metals and non-metals. So, pause, read. Can you come up with an answer here? Are the ions anions or cations? Hopefully you paused and came up with, because they're positive metals, they are cations. How about these guys? Hopefully you pause and noticed again, ooh, sorry, noticed again that these are negative because they're non-metals. And again, now these transition, uh-oh, are these transition metals going to be anions or cations? Hopefully that makes sense. Any metal, doesn't matter if it's regular metals, transition metals, or those inner transition metals, they're all going to have positive charges. All right, this is at the end of your packet. And again, you have your metals over here and your non-metals over here. In the next video, we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about these guys. Because if you notice, hmm, now they have multiple names because they have multiple charges. All right, we'll see you in class.